people are being killed everywhere like everywhere and it's like now people are noticing that this is happening like it's yeah. been happening for ages but mm-hmm. right now it's in the media a lot more i work with people in jail and i know that there is more black people in jail than there is out here right now like so if they can't talk i have to speak for them i have mm-hmm. to be their voice because firstly they can't march they can't even plan um some kind of protest at the prison because they're on 23 hour bang up and even if they did try to do some kind it will be like rebelling which means that they're probably going to get written up if they're looking at like nearly being released that's all something that's going to come into like effect like oh well you started this on da, 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 da. it doesn't matter that it's black lives matter it doesn't matter that it's a protest they can't do that so in order for me to do what i'm doing i have to speak about prison I, like i have to i have to keep talking about prison until things change that's something about you that i love through and through is that like when it comes to your work you're so unapologetic about what you do with your chest from when i met you is like i'm here to talk about people in prison i'm here to talk about women in prison prison. whilst we're in the middle of a pandemic and everyone's speaking about this new normal well about you are in prison what does covid mean for those who are locked up inside i'm vexed about everything with the whole covid when it comes to prison um, population because I just don't think they've handled it very well. Like, 23 hour bang up, like, I went to jail and I don't even know. I mean, I've been on bang up, like, for hours, but I don't know if it was 23 hour bang up. Like, I feel like that's a lot. And even when it comes to, for example, in the beginning, they were saying to people in prison, if you, if you see any signs of the symptoms of the COVID or whatever, uh, the corona, you have to report it to a, an officer. What that automatically means is that you then get locked up. So you're not on 23 hour bang up, you're just locked up on your own. They bring you the food, they slide it and that's it, you're on bang up. So you won't be calling nobody, you won't be doing anything. There's no socializing with anyone. And I think that's just ridiculous. So what then that what that then caused was people that did experience symptoms won't tell the officer that they had these symptoms mm. because they don't want to be locked up for 24 hours do you understand mm. i know it's just an hour difference but it's a lot especially yeah. in jail um so they it does not make a difference to know you're gonna get an hour like an hour right um so that then obviously it's really interesting because when we when we hear the news of all the numbers and how many people have grown and all this stuff and how many people have died it's very interesting for me that we don't hear a lot about the prisons. Mm. You have to go and find that information somewhere else. Mm. But there has been deaths in prisons. There have been officers that con- uh, conducted um, corona. There's inmates that, have, that I think there's I think a couple inmates that have died. Like we don't hear this. You don't hear about this yeah. stuff because they don't want you to know about this. Even though they're saying we're scared that inmates, you know, are under a lot of like risk, and they are. They're the biggest people at risk because. They share everything. The, the phones are shared. You know, they started a new job in prison, which is the COVID cleanup. Mm. Uh, COVID cleanup basically means going around the landing and just wiping down all the surfaces every hour or so. Which know. is something that should have and been done. It should have been exactly. It should have been happened anyway. And I remember saying to the person, I think mean, I said, oh, "Who was I speaking to?" You? I said, "They give you gloves." Mm. I said, "Yeah, they gave us gloves." I said, oh, "Okay, cool. That's good. At least they give you that." I said, "They give you masks." Like, no. So what do you mean they didn't give you? But you're the COVID cleanup, so you're going to different landings. Like, you can't, you have to wear a mask. And they're like, no, they ain't got no mask. Like, these officers ain't got no mask for us. I said, mm. get your t shirt or get your boxers. And literally, I was explaining how to put it so that they can have some kind of mask. Mm. And um, he actually done it and got told off. Wow. He's not allowed to cover wow. his face like that. Wow. And I think I think for me, that's what's so frustrating when we think about the prison population, how they're continuously um, like this afterthought or continuously forgotten about. Um, yeah. I guess the first thing I want to speak about is your latest poem, um, Forgotten People. Obviously, yes. When you call me, when I got that call, it was <laughs> like, yo, sis, can you jump on this? Poem, I was, I was gassed. I was a little <laughs> nervous because I was like, me? Poem. Um, but equally, I was very honoured. Like, I was honoured to be a part of, um, and you would even think of me um, to jump on. Um, and I guess that's the first track that I've been on. So, yeah. Um, so, tell 
me a little bit more about forgotten people where the concept came from um and what is actually being spoken about in the poem and of course now this george floyd it being killed in front of us just i refuse to watch that like i really refuse but unfortunately everywhere you look is mm. there it's, you can see the man with his knee on the guy's neck just there you know um and so i actually talked to my producer and i said look you see the forgotten people it needs to happen now but yeah. i don't want it to just be my voice mm. i want it to be mine and other people's voices and not just black people I need yeah. black, white, Asian, everybody, because this isn't just a black issue. Yes, mm-hmm. it's black people that's being killed, but this is not a black issue. And mm-hmm. you, if you're white and still think, oh, this is not that serious, then clearly you're the issue. Do you understand? Because it, it, it's not just black people. Like, we have to come together. There's a whole reason why we've been, like, separated and divided. Like, mm-hmm. if we continue to let that divide conquer all of us, then we're just going to be, like, you know, Jewish people have their own schools, have their own shops. Like, black people are going to do like, okay, cool, let's, you know, and I, I personally don't think that's a bad thing, to be honest, because we do support like, a lot. I'm, I'm here for that. I'm on this. Like, we should have our own universities. We should have our own schools. We should do all of that. Like, I'm very much here for that. Um, but equally, I think there is something important in allyship and other races in particular, white people giving up power, giving up space um, and not, like, letting us in but actually saying, actually, you should be in this position because you deserve to be in this position. And the thing is, though, that's the one thing that I did really love about the forgotten people. So yeah. when at first I did hear the other voices and I did hear the other perspectives, perspective, perspectives, um, I was like, okay, this is good. This is different. And I guess I wanted to know, when approaching any um, anyone who wasn't Black um, or a person of colour, was there any resistance to that? Was there any, like... <sighs> I, I don't know about yeah. this or and and did it come from a place of this shouldn't be my space or did it come from a place of um I just don't want to do it um was there any resistance it, there, no there was there was like and it wasn't it wasn't bad it was even there was even black my black friends that were like I, I can't do it like I, I just can't that was more so because of the pain that they were feeling and the anger like some of my friends just like sent me voice notes saying you know the police is corrupt and all this stuff like that obviously yeah. I get that but it needs to be deeper but when it came to like my white friends some of them were they were like you know this is I really would love to do this and I'm so grateful for you asking me but I just don't know what to say because if I'm honest some of them are already doing that work they're already going out and working with you know black communities and making sure black people in especially the criminal justice system get the support so they get it but even then it's like what do I say like what how do I put it in writing I feel like a lot of people had to dig deep but I'm grateful for the people that did do it mm-hmm. there's people that said that they they don't want to do it because they're still angry at their own white people um especially because they're already promoting stuff for example people have come forward and said they've they've stopped talking to their their own white friends because yeah. for years they've been promoting change but these same people that are now buying t-shirts and and putting up the fist and whatever right. they've never supported they've never supported right. them in any of the aspects that they've been doing and those mm-hmm. aspects support black people so why mm-hmm. are you now all of a sudden you know but I think I think it was good it was nice to make people think a little bit and just kind of sit down to understand that it's not just black people that's angry white people are angry too they are there to support us but it, it wasn't easy I'm not gonna lie even listening it to it myself I, yeah I, I was like raw like British woman of Nigerian descent the question will I be forgotten when I die I feel uncomfortable when I think about being an ally not because I'm reluctant but because I've been so redundant white and unaware for so long please stop killing us I speak for the forgotten people, the ones you would rather see buried, tortured and would call yourself lucky if you never had to see us. We are not your slaves, your prisoners, and we will never be your property, not again. We've got to rise. Oh. I guess that's why you fast in cages, paint hateful words on our streets, throw rocks and stones in the form of police brutality. Um, one thing that I guess like the poem is the undertone of the poem is basically about police brutality. Sandra Bland, 
and Sarah Reed in particular, I like to focus on women, in particular black women. And I think about how they were taken into police custody and didn't come out alive. Um, I have to to be honest, I did think about you and I did think, what were your feelings on that? Um, As someone who has been in police custody, um, I just wondered if if there was ever that fear with you um, going inside that actually, I don't know if I gonna come out. Yeah, yeah. I think for me, the thing is, the thing is, if I'm honest, before ever being arrested or going to prison, I didn't really, I guess I didn't really read into too much to this whole police brutality stuff. Like I'd hear about it and I'd be like, oh my God, really? Like, what? Like, it's kind of shocking. I guess it's the unknown. You don't really like, you don't really, like, you don't really know of it so much that you hear about it, but it's like, oh, like, this is crazy. How did this again? You know, I guess I never really had a fear when I was getting arrested um, that something bad could happen to me. And that's probably because the officers that arrested me were actually very okay. They were, they were cool officers. Like, I think it was because they're from ENDS, like, clearly. Um, maybe if I was in a different area, it might have been different. But um, if I'm honest, certain police stations are labelled. We know certain police stations, if you go in there, you might not come out. Other police stations, they actually have human police officers who are not racist and actually do the jobs right so when I got arrested the first time the officers was just really nice See, like you know they did put me in handcuffs they talked to me they didn't throw me in a van you know um I had to end up because I had stitches and I had to go hospital um they took me to the hospital they allowed my sisters my sister to sit in the waiting room like in the A&E but on, on the other side so I can see her even though I was arrested um, they even told me that I was going to be in the station for a very long time and if I wanted I could ask my sister to buy me some food because the prison food is not great so mm-hmm. I didn't have that fear I didn't have the fear of oh something is wrong here the, the police might kill me or whatever I didn't have that fear I think it was more after I actually you know went to prison after I had the conviction I think once you have a conviction you're looked at differently I think when I first got arrested, I was a brand new person and no priors, you know, I was just this innocent 21 year old person that had had this fight and, you know, had owned up to the fight. Even it's, I wasn't trying to run. Maybe if I was on the run they, mm. they, and they had to find me, it would have been a bit different, yeah. but I never, I handed myself in the same day. Um, I think after that, after you have a conviction, that's when things get a bit tricky because I have been actually arrested two times after going to prison um and each time I've known that they're gonna arrest me when you've got a criminal conviction when you've been involved with situations like that already no one really wants to listen to you no one if you have no no evidence there's no witnesses there's no nothing no one's gonna listen so this is why police that are crook crooked they get off a lot because people like us don't want to go through the whole process of being ripped apart like oh yeah but you did this last time or oh, what, what makes you think that what's different from this case and the, like you're, you're you're just especially with having a record you're just this person so it doesn't make sense that you yeah. you you know maybe if we had like maybe if we had a separate complaints team like for example yeah in prison you can't complain about officer they tell you you can mm-hmm. but the officers are the one that deals with the complaints yeah so that means that officer is going to see that I said that I feel like he did this, this, and this, and this. And then ideally, he has the right, he has, he, he can just be like, well, I'm just not going to help her no more. And mm. then nothing, none of my people will get put through. I won't get let out at certain times. I won't, do you understand? So it's very hard with police brutality and even officers in power. I think we just need to change. There needs to be a new process. There needs to be like a complaints team that looks like us, mm. like that reflects us. Because right now, we're complaining about white people to white people. I think there definitely needs to be, as you're basically alluding to, like this independent organisation that is separate from the police um, that deals with things. But even for me, even with that, there's still this issue around who funds it, the government. And if if the government then funds it, then what does that mean? They're still going to be able, there's going to be a particular partnership that will happen. And that's why for me, I fully hear what you're saying about, you know, there's there's good police and bad police. 
Um, but no, nah, man, you're all dodgy. Not because they're bad people in their core, yeah. but just because I think when you're part of a particular system, like no matter how good you try to be, you know that like you're doing things that aren't cool, i.e. like, for example, like um, whether you're profiling. So you might yeah. be a good person, but because of who you've been around, what you've been around, what you've been listening to, you're going to be like, oh yeah, black men, specifically i'm gonna stop do you know what i mean even though in being in your core you're cool and that's something that i don't know like i've been seeing a lot lately around is there such good thing as good police and bad police equally something that you spoke about in terms of establishment and there needs to be a shift and a change i've seen yeah. a lot co of conversation around is um prison abolishment so abolishing prisons and not having a prison system i guess like we have now are having a different system um what do you think about that what do you think about the current system and especially around the word of rehabilitation um because for me when i look and speak to people who have been to prison it doesn't seem like there's much rehabilitating as opposed to it being a space where people are held um yeah. people who have committed crimes are held and so what yeah. do you think about um abolishing prison what do you think about or a change in system. What 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 does that look like for you? I don't even. I personally don't think that they would ever abolish prisons because they make too much money from it, um, and it's a power trip. And look how many black people are enslaved in there. I don't think that's something that they want to give up. But I've, I'm pretty sure I recently saw on Twitter that they're trying to open three new prisons. You know that that confuses me because when they lock people up and send them to jail they basically say that this person is broken this person needs help we need to help them and this is why we're locking them up but then when they are in jail there is no help there mm. is no this word rehabilitation i don't know where they found it i don't know if they just went into a dictionary <laughs> and said, that's the best word. no big one thing they said let's find a word that's gonna make this 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 um stand for us so that we can build these prisons we need to find the right word that so people know that we are trying to help but don't let on that we're not going to help them. So rehabilitation in prison is fake. It's a lie. It's a shamble. There's mm. no rehabilitation. I think inmates rehabilitate themselves. When I go back to prison, the one thing that I say to people is, I used to live here. Mm. I'm not telling you as an officer. I'm not here as, you know, um, somebody that's going to tell you everything's going to be perfect because it's not. It's mm. taken me a very long time to get here, but it's because I did not give up on myself. In yeah. prison, it's very easy to get up on yourself because there's nothing there. Like, yeah. you know, if you're depressed before jail, de depression is going to, it'll probably kill you in there. Because yeah. by the time you get written up to see some kind of therapist, it could be too late. Yeah. There's a wait list, like, longer than me. Do you understand? So all these little things that are there that are available to help people, you won't get on them. Like, yeah. you, you probably do your whole sentence and once you're leaving, then, oh, oh, you didn't do this course. Then all of a sudden, yeah. now you want me to do the course. There's no all time. All of a sudden, yeah. Do you understand? So for me personally, yeah. I think, for example, with women, I definitely would strongly advise no prison. I'll just say um, women's centers. Like, if we're working with women before this whole, like, the, what hurts me the most is when I meet women and their issues, I don't say, I don't want to say their issues are small, but I know that their issues, had they been dealt with before they could overcome them, do you understand? They wouldn't be going through this. They wouldn't like, and it's not like they haven't asked for help. Sometimes, yeah, yeah some people don't ask for help because there's that fear of if I ask for help, I'm weak or whatever. But yeah. there's people that's been screaming for help. These women are saying, look, I need help. But ideally, you don't realize they need help until they're up in front of a judge and all of a sudden you're like, oh, but now you're a criminal, so you can't even go to this. We're going to put you in prison and maybe you can get the help there. But there's no help there. Okay, there's no. no help. And I think there just needs to be more support in actually helping people instead of locking them up. Mm -hmm. I think no, I agree. Help. No, I agree. And I'm with you wholeheartedly. I think as you were speaking, there were so many things that was going on in my mind. I was like, yes, yes. Um, I think, especially with some of the last points that you mentioned, um, about needing help, um, especially for me working with women who've been victims of domestic sexual violence, been in the criminal justice system. Like I'm seeing women being arrested for petty crimes. Like I'm talking getting arrested for stealing stuff from Sainsbury's, but no, they need to feed their children. Um, exactly. And for me, like you said, it's little things such as that. It's things like you fighting for your sister. Me, I've got two sisters. 
I'm on, I don't want to say I'm violent. <laughs> but I'm on backing. If worse comes yeah. to worse, yo, I'm, my first thing isn't to fight. However, yeah. yo, like that, that's going down. Cool. Um, yeah. And to think yeah. about the fact that like something as minute, I'm going to say as minute as a fight will have you in prison for me is absolutely ridiculous. It's, it's absolutely yeah. ridiculous. And um, as you were speaking, you also mentioned two um, prisons, one which is no longer around Holloway prison is it officially closed down now it's um officially closed it's officially down. closed down and yeah i just wanted to speak to you about your time in prison if that's okay um yeah. and actually especially around being in holloway um the police trying to deport you then you having to go to a national prison for a yeah, national, prison, a national prison for a national prison um yes and i think even listening to that that's that's a bit of a journey in itself if that makes any sense in terms of prison in terms of being in the prison in the uk um going to that foreign national prison that's still here but you're around people who are other foreign nationals and so it's almost like this kind of journey of seeing prison institutions um but yeah just tell me about your experiences what you saw um and your journey um through those prisons yeah um you said boy Boy, boy. Obviously, Holloway, yeah. Holloway's closed down. Holloway was the main female prison. I think it was actually a life as prison. So you only usually would go there before you are then transferred to the main prison or if you're on remand. Otherwise, mm. you're a life on. The, the lifers have their own wing and it's all done up pretty and stuff. Like, mm. But Holloway was my first experience of going to prison. I'll be honest, yeah. My whole sentence in was like a dream it was like a movie like i really think i just make a film like this orange is the new black and wentworth they ain't ready like they need to make hey it. they ain't ready, they ain't ready. They need to produce. i'm down let's do it <laughs> i'm telling you because that whole journey from the hall in that van that i used to see all the time and just think oh my god there's, there's prisoners in there you know imagine there's mm-hmm. prisoners in there prisoners are you right doing mm-hmm. some weird things because i can you, <laughs> you know, know but i actually know them ones i don't know them ones. i felt like a couple times i feel like there's certain man banging on the door <laughs> I know. trust me because they can see you like you you know you sit in that van yeah you can see everything clear like you're in a car clear like it's black to everybody else but it is clear like we can see everything so i remember passing these bars and thinking oh my god i'm never gonna have a drink of wine what <laughs> this is crazy you know women looking nice like girls makeup done and i'm just like my makeup is also done i've got my wig on so i ain't going out this is mad um and then when you get there i swear the whole check alone was enough for me out like if 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 God could have just taken me there and then, yeah, I probably would have just said, thank you, Jesus. The first thing that got taken away from me was my wig. That was just the disrespectful thing I've ever felt in my life. Like, you know, back in the day, you had the instant weave, you just clipping and you just mm. had the hair on top. That's what I had. And I remember the woman just going for my head. And I was like, what? and she was like, is that your hair? No. She was like, is it glued in or sewed in? Like, she knew how weaves are done. Mm. I was like, it's clipped in. She went, you're not going to have to have that in, love. You have to take it off. I remember looking at her like, huh? Woman took my hair, put it in a bag, and zipped the bag. And now I've got cane rows going back that's not even neat because no one was meant to see them cane rows. And, you know? <laughs> and my underneath with cane rows. You know, the, you know them, them, them inside cane rows that people don't see? <sighs> like, I just started crying because I was like, this is crazy. Like, I'm literally looking at her like, and she's like, don't worry, they're going to take you to induction. And then after that, you'll come up to the main bit. I remember you told me about the food. The kebab. Was it the kebab? the kebab? No, the kebab came, yeah. Because I I refused that food. And then when they put me on induction, that's when I met the Ugandan lady. Because she heard me. Because I didn't want to speak my language. I didn't want to speak English. But I didn't want people to know what I was saying because I was so hurt. So I was trying to speak really quietly. But obviously in my language. And she heard me. And that's why she, I think she kind of mothered me. She was like, mm. oh, you can eat something. We've got kebab. I was like, really? <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure? Like, she's like, yes, we have it. I mean, it's not the same as outside, but I was like, all right, then. And I remember when she brought it out, I was like, oh, my God, I'm really enjoying it. Prison is mad. <laughs> that is it, because I used to love food. But I remember, I remember signing up. They, they put you through to 
the your induction is where you check immigration, housing, everything has to get done there. Like I remember them telling me about my flat and saying that the length of time I'm doing, I probably should sign my flat away. Um, and I said, but if I sign it away and I get tagged, where do I go? Mm. And they were like, oh, we'll find you somewhere. But I'm not stupid. So I said, no, I'm not signing my flat away. I, I literally, and this is things that people don't know. I called my council and I said to them, I'm in prison for this long. What do I do to keep my flat? Mm. And I worked out how to keep it. I signed it over to my mother and she was basically the caretaker, which meant that they would have to pay rent. So you can keep your house, but this information is not given to you. Do you understand? And if it it is given to you, the information that it'll give you is no, just sign it away. So then Mm. you're coming out to nothing. Already Mm -hmm. you've lost all this time. At least that you have one piece of something that you can just say is mine. So mm-hmm. I, I thought that And I guess that. you can go home too. Because after exactly. prison, you want to go somewhere where you feel safe after being there. Do you know what I'm trying to say? And imagine exactly. having to then find a new space, which is probably going to be a hostel. It's not even going to be like a home situation. But yeah. And we know about how these hostels are. You know, you've got people going out from prison and going to these hostels and they've had drug issues. And then you put them in a hostel mm-hmm. where everyone is using drugs and they, mm-hmm. by escaping it or trying to run away from it, that's breaking their conditions. Yeah, yeah, all they're trying to do is trying to avoid being in a situation that will probably take them into a deeper hole. I would watch women leave. Like, they're leaving. Like, not weekend release, because Holloway, you can't do that. They're going home. Um, I remember saying, why do, you, why do they keep coming back? Mm. Like, I don't just want to go home. Why? Why do they keep coming back? I remember asking one girl why she came back. She said, oh, I just want to see my girlfriend. And I went, okay. Another girl, um, I asked her why. She said that she missed her probation because... As soon as she got out, her family met her mm. and they went on a bender. Mm-hmm. Somebody that shouldn't really be going on a bender, the family took her out and she missed the whole probation meeting, everything. So by the weekend, she was back with us, you know. And now at that time, I'll be honest, I didn't understand them winning. I really just looked at them like, you're wasting my time. Like, I'm in here, I want to go home and you're coming back here. I really looked at them like they were just hopeless and honestly mm-hmm. I didn't understand but I would soon find out when you come out of jail how easy it is for you to come back into that system how yeah. how easy it is for you to be caught back up in a situation even if you are trying really hard to avoid it like mm-hmm. I'm living of it so Holloway I think the routine became a lot easier um it, it's really weird how you become it becomes the norm you know, I got my own cell. Initially, I was in a cell with, like, I think it was six of us. Yeah. Um, the going to the toilet situation was a bit of a madness. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I finally got my own cell. Um, and I remember Holloway was when I saw my first therapist. Well, not my first, first therapist in the world, just in prison. And I tried really hard not to share with her because I don't share with people. I don't. And if I've shared with you, especially, let's say, like, for example, a doctor. I'd rather see the same doctor. I don't want to have to repeat myself. Just the notes are there. Just check them and then ask me to explain what you don't understand. Even though you're the doctor, there might be things that you don't understand that I need to explain. That's fine. I don't want to have to explain the whole thing. But Do you know what explain- I find? So, sorry to interrupt you. Do you know what I find? Um, like, it's, it, like, I fully hear that. I fully hear that. But I've equally heard like the opposite in terms of um, not in a prison setting, but I guess with the work I do um, with sexual violence and women wanting you to ask them their version of their story at that particular time in their life. Um, And this thing of like coming into a first session and for me not really enough all these things that I know about them and Mm -hmm. them feeling very much like, wow, why do you know all of this? I've never even met you. And I guess even though they know a referral has been done, (laughs) all the information is there, there's still this thing of them wanting to feel like they have told me what they want to tell me as opposed to me knowing because they're a part of this system. Yeah. So I fully hear what you're saying. It's like equally yeah. having to repeat it time and time again is long. Like re- repeat your trauma, especially trauma, like having to go through things. Why are you here? What's wrong? Over yeah. and over again to a stranger or equally can be can be very um, stressful. So no, I, I do hear you. I just kind of wanted to. And remember, you have to do that anyway at probation. So at probation, your first, your sen- pre-sentencing report, you have to do that. You have to sit down and talk to your probation officer about everything that's ever happened in your life. Yeah. So a clear report of what they suggest. Like my probation officer suggested um, a community service. 
mm. like suspended sentence that like, he did not push for a prison sentence because if I ever decided to share all the things that ever happened to me people would have been like whoa because even him he sat there and looked at me dropped the pen and just said I don't think there's a right time to commit crimes mm. but I strongly believe that if you had let all the other things that happened to you that you have clearly just moved on from and you know I, I'm surprised that you you act so normal you possess so normally you know you you've gone to college you, you're going out of your way to like go to courses and stuff he said I feel like at the age of probably 13 14 you probably could have already started committing crimes and I, I mm. would you if had you walked into my um office at that age and you told me what has happened before all this I would you would have just been like any other person oh mm. yeah this has happened to them and then they turned to this and then da, 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 da. like I was like ideally he what he was saying was that all the things that happened to me prior to me having this fight would have already put me to prison had I wanted to act on those emotions yeah. and those behaviors do you know what I mean so he he suggested that I don't get sent to prison however what they did is put me into in prison and now I have no one and all those things that he knows mm -hmm. are now at the forefront of my like my whole life because I have nothing to think about but every single piece of trauma that's ever happened to me up until this time mm -hmm. so for me to see a therapist that wants me to open up that wants me to start telling her about my stuff the last time I did that was in probation and I'm in jail now so you know what's talking to somebody going to help me it's not and I remember trying really hard not to speak to this woman we had our sessions eventually I opened up I think it was probably the fourth session I was so disappointed that I even opened up because that fourth session this woman had she told me that she was leaving prior to oh. these four sessions, Ooh. I would have never, ever opened up. But once I finally opened up and the end, our session was ending, <sighs> she then told me that she was leaving and was going to make a referral to the next person so that we can basically start off where I said, don't do the referral. Don't mm -hmm. do it. I said, you, did you not know that your job was ending? I said, you sat here with me and begged me to talk to you. And I've spoken to you and told you everything. And now you're leaving. Yeah. I said, do you know how that makes me feel? Yeah. Like, I was so hurt. And I remember at that moment, like, I, I probably, if I wasn't suicidal already, that conversation made me more suicidal. Because in my head now, there's another person that knows all my business that's not even working here no more. They've gone. They can just leave and go wherever they want mm -hmm. and talk about whatever they want to. But they know my personal information. And that mm -hmm. was a lot for me to deal mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. So after dealing with that, you know, it was... It, I refused. I refused to talk to anybody. I refused to take on any kind of courses that weren't to do with education. Um, and I became normal. It became normal. I was in jail. And I remember just thinking, oh, do you know what? That's it now. I'm fully, I'm fully an inmate. You're fully I'm involved. In like you're fully in it. In. That's it. Um, I'm, here. I'm in. Was, I'm in. And, and, and I guess like there's something about the fact that you're saying about like being fully in. Um, and I, I just wondered, as you were saying that, was that same space afforded to you when you was in a foreign national prison? So mm. were you able to go outside and take walks? Because in my mind, I feel like no. But then equally, I'm just like, I wonder what the, what the differences were with Holloway and the foreign national prison. The foreign national prison. The foreign national prison now, which took me about three hours to get to, like I was DPD package. Like literally, I sat in this for three hours. Just Did you say DPD get... package? I swear I'm telling you, I swear I'm telling you that just, just going, doo -doo, doo -doo, doo -doo, just, just being driven. I'll tell you that journey there was a mad journey because mm. Holloway's journey was like, oh my God, I'm going to prison. But now I'm an inmate. So it's like, okay, another place. I was scared because it's, I knew it's a foreign national prison and I knew I shouldn't be going there. But so I was scared because I was going there. Mm -hmm. Can you the explain journey, to me how, why you was going there? Like how come you were going to this foreign, this foreign national prison when you were a British so, citizen? Yeah, it's really, it's basically, I basically went to a foreign national uh, prison by default, basically. Mm -hmm. It's like one of them boxes. Somebody, <laughs> I won't say a white person, um, obviously looked at the system and said and saw that my place of birth is Uganda. Not even that she's got a British passport. My place of birth is Uganda. Now, mm -hmm. bearing in mind, I've lived here forever. Like, people had to tell me about Uganda. Like, you remember this person? I'm like, no, I don't know. 
Ah, mm-hmm. oh, remember this auntie, <laughs> Uncle Dis. Oh, remember your cousin thing yes, is that you used to play with them. Yeah, I'm like, at what you? age? At two? Oh, I don't remember. Yeah, at two. They'll be like, yeah, I don't remember. You was like two years old. Huh? <laughs> like they told you when you was two. Do I remember what I did? I, when don't I, ask I, if I remember my birth. Like I don't remember my birth. Oh, like, uh, I, cannot. I cannot. I cannot. <laughs> so obviously they clearly just sent me there because they saw that. Because I remember. When they did tell me the night before, I was like, no, but that's before a national prison. I don't mm. need to go there. I, like, I'm British. And they were like, they, the only reason I went to this place is because they threatened me. So if I refused to go, I would have gone to the block. And the block is basically where you have no TV. You get put on like basic. So you have limited money, which means mm. less credit for your phone, less money to spend on canteen. And I already felt like I was limited with just mm-hmm. being in the cell that I was in. So I was like, okay, cool. In my head, I thought, eventually they'll sort it out in it because it's clearly wrong. And I just remember black people disappearing. Nobody. What do you mean disappearing? As in, yeah. in terms of staff or in terms of actual prisoners? No, or... like when we was going to this place, yeah. it got to the point where I saw nobody else that even looks like me in this area. Like there was no... Okay, okay. This might sound crazy, but... If I don't see police on the road or road man, a couple of road man in a hoodie, like someone, someone, someone doing something that looks normal to me, I'm a bit concerned. Yeah, like, a bit nervous. It's a bit get out ish. A bit like, like what's going on? Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, yeah. like yeah. something's not okay. Like my people ain't here, and there's a reason why my people ain't here. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so uh, okay. When we got to the prison, the foreign national prison, which was in Lincolnshire. Mm-hmm. Like basically in Manchester. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'm from South East London. That's the Mouse. Um, I saw my first black person. He was yeah. an officer. He opened mm-hmm. the gate. There was a yeah. black officer. He opened the gate for us. Who knew that would be the last time I see that officer? There was no black officers in the foreign national prison. Tell me how that makes sense. Okay. Now no, you need to make that make. They need to make that make sense. There's no. <laughs> it make sense. That's there's no that. black officers or there's yeah like you did not see black officers in a foreign national prison there was no black officers there it, all the oh. um all the what do you call it diversity stuff and all that stuff was led by white people now the way in area was beautiful it was it was and that's see me things like that freak me out because this is beautiful it's too good for people that like us that are meant to be criminals we're not meant to have good things so on top of that foreign national like national for I mean foreign criminals as well on top of that exactly yeah was I, mean, I, was like, about something? I was on the gets like as soon as we went into that into that waiting area mm. the magazines were up to date I started looking at all the magazines on the dates yeah I'm, I'm telling you I was like this is something's wrong and the girls are looking at me the women are like Brenda it's all right it's just that there's magazines I'm like no, 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 no. There's magazines. There's carpet. We're sitting on sofas. Yeah. As comfortable as I am right now is as comfortable I was on them sofas. That's how comfortable the sofas were. <laughs> and I yeah. said, this is something is wrong. It was like, it was like our last meal. Like this is our last, the yeah. last time last that we will ever. ever. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It was yeah. something wasn't working. So they give you keys. In prison, keys are a symbol of freedom. You can't have keys, right? Because you're locked up. So the only keys you see or hear are the officer's keys. In the foreign national prison, they give you keys, which which symbolizes freedom, but yet you're very, very far from freedom. Mm. Like, in my eyes, I was so far away from freedom. So for them to give me keys, it's like, it's like, it's like they're mocking you. Like, here you go, mm. you're going to have this for now because you, you won't be here any, like, that much longer. Mm. Um, it's kind of like what you said, even, like, with the nice chairs and the magazines it's like kind of taunting you kind of giving you this taste of like freedom of like luxury of quote-unquote normal life when yeah. that is far from the truth I and mean, then far from the experience in the foreign national prison we you work you don't there is education but apparently the waiting list is too long mm-hmm. so you have to work so there was not really anyone on education everyone was in the factory and i remember going there and realized i said what are we making like, oh, so you make the clothes for the prisons? Oh, we oui, the foreign nationals. <laughs> you make the clothes for the prisons. We make the clothes. We sew them. I sewed, babe. I sewed. I sewed. The, cl- I the sewed. clothes <laughs> that other people will wear in other prisons. Yes. Yes. You know what? I guess like prison labor is a whole other conversation. We're not going to get into today, but that's the whole <laughs> next. Thing. So one of the the 
the tracksuit bottoms in the inside um of the tracksuit bottom the leg i i was sewing and i thought how funny would it be if i sewed a, a, the letter b in one of these tracksuit bottoms and someone's gonna wear it somewhere like and i did it and we all laughed about it and that 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 went someone took it they put their next part on it someone else took it da, 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 it became someone's tracksuit bottoms so who would have known that those same tracksuit bottoms will become mine. Is, what, that, the one, is that not God telling me that what, the letter B? I was meant to be a girl? Sis, that letter B that I sewed into the inner leg of the tracksuit bottom, when I finally left that prison and went to Downview, this is all the way in Surrey, yeah? Surrey. Mm -hmm. I got enhanced. And when I finally got enhanced, I was allowed to keep, like, so I can do my own washing. So you go to the laundry room, wash your stuff, because the you have to change the tracksuit bombs every Friday or something. Mm -hmm. So when you're enhanced, you do your own washing. So you just keep that one pair and then just wash them because you've mm -hmm. got other stuff. Do you understand? Or the two pairs and you just wash them. And then one day I just thought, yeah, let me put these inside out and go and do my washing. Da -da -da -da. I'm in my room, like, shh, inside out, like shook it. And I put it down. And you know when you can see something in a corner and I'm like, mm. and I looked at the tracksuit bottom, yeah. And the B, the letter B was there. And I swear to you, I was like this. It can't be. It can't be. It, that's that's not bad. Unless somebody else is going around putting letter B's putting in, letter B's B's in, in <laughs> tracksuit buttons. And it's so mad, I guess, because B for Brenda as well. I feel like that is um, a thing. Like, I'm very much here for signs and omens and moments. And um, in that moment, what, what did that do for you, if anything? In that moment, I had to just literally kneel down and laugh with God quickly and say to him, you know what, you're a joker, you know that you're a joker. Because mm. by the time I got, like, because leaving down, leaving the foreign national prison was such a struggle, going through hunger strikes, then finally, eventually having my mum bringing the passport and then confirming I was British and then, then finally transferring me. Um, but after the pills, like, got turned down and stuff, like, I remember one girl, she used to always listen to Mary Mary's album, and she used to always tell me to pray, and I was telling her, why? Mm. you know like I pray here and there but you know because I, I had been saved in Holloway this is there's a whole long story but I'd been saved clearly in Holloway and realized that God had my back but it still wasn't really fully connected you know what I mean so she gave me the CD and said look I, I my appeals if your appeal is not working my appeal is not going to go through so I'm going to give you the CD listen to it see if it helps and mm -hmm. it really did because each song on that album it was like God was talking to me personally, nobody else, just me personally. Like, yeah. And I decided from that moment, I need to, everything that I do in this place has to be through God. Mm -hmm. And I think that's when things started happening. So when I would put in an application, I will pray about the application first. Like, and I would say, if this is your will, let it be done, you know? Yes. Um, and then I'll put the application through. But I would mm -hmm. pray about it. Whereas before I was just putting applications and I'm like, why are you doing, why are you not doing this, you know? Um, that whole B in the in the bottom of my tracksuit bottom, that's when I just thought, God, you see, because I started praying, because I don't think that, I personally think if I hadn't started praying, I don't think that he would have shown me that B. I think that mm -hmm. he showed me that B just to remind me, I know you didn't believe me before, but mm -hmm. there was a reason why you had to come here. Yeah. And in that moment, I thought, I don't know what the reason is. I don't yeah. know why. I don't know what it's going to do, you know, but there has to be a reason. And literally, I swear to you, everything after that kind of went smooth. One thing that you always I remember in jail is the sitting down in, I guess, the, our, our free flow time with the other women and looking at that gate and everyone imagining how they would feel if a gate was to ever open. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've watched Orange is the New Black, but um, there's a scene in Orange where something similar like that happens. I think I remember that. <laughs> um... I can't remember because I remember like I stopped watching Orish is the new black after Pussy died. After that, I said my heart, I could, I cannot, I cannot. Um, and do you know what? Do you see that even when she died, how they portrayed her, how they tried to portray her first, and that's, mm -hmm. that, I guess, what happens normally in it. And I, mm -hmm. I, I was really surprised actually that Orin showed that side mm -hmm. that the officers were trying to find pictures that make her look. Or come across a bit more ghetto when we yeah. all knew we all knew who she was. Do you know what I mean? Do you feel like Orange is the New Black has 
a I guess that's an American prison obviously it's a drama do you think it was a level of reflection do you feel like there was a lot of truth or some truth in that yes 100% um I'm very careful when I watch certain shows especially when it's to do with prisons um because I don't want like one of my poems I say like um talking about I, I talk about media perception of life behind bars playing through my head and mm-hmm. I saw a lot of I watched a lot of prison stuff and so that's all I ever thought about mm-hmm. whereas Orange some of the storylines yeah some of them are just like okay that's that's a bit crazy yeah it's but a bit of some of them yeah it's like they they are real real serious stories because it isn't Orin meant to be based of that American lady that actually did end up going into prison and then she kind yeah. of wrote this story about herself but obviously there's obviously a lot of extra stuff in it but there was a lot of truth I took a while to watch it but there was a lot of truth in it um what I am watching now is Wentworth okay which yeah is straight one. yeah now see that one I'm not sure I can't I I, I think Orange is like they have competition Wentworth went in like right, Wentworth yeah, yeah. went in to the point where they fully talk about the officers that's corrupt they fully show the um inmates paying officers they fully show sexual activity happening with um, like it's 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 so raw I've watched it I'm on season I finished season season four yesterday mm. and I've been crying mm. like I've caught me a couple of times but this one I've been crying throughout yeah. it like because I'm like, this is real, yeah. you know? So yeah, like, but they did have a scene where the gate opens and they will run. And we, I remember watching that scene thinking, oh my, like I cried at that scene because I was like, every girl that I was in jail with, if they watched that, if we watched that scene together, we'd all cry Yeah, you know, because we all know that feeling. That but feeling. I, just out of, out of even the story, I definitely want, at some point I want to host a prison reunion does that make sense so yes, anybody that I was in with around 2008 2000 2009 2010 anyone that has enjoyed with me around that time or know me I want to do a, an event that we kind of all talk where are we at now what do we need help with it's not just an event where we sit down and drink and eat food no mm-hmm. we talk here yeah, we share stories but also mm-hmm we find out what the other person needs can I help you get that like oh you want to work in this oh my friend Kafai actually does that maybe you should talk to her do you know what I mean like so there's like little things that you can sit down even if it's like it's like a panel and people can go and speak share their story and then you connect with people like just this is how like collaborations and mentoring starts and I think that those kind of women some of them might even be doing bigger bigger things do you know what I mean and I think that for them to kind of be like wait Brenda you you too shit let's do this together you know so I'd love to do something like that yeah Yeah. I'm so here for that like I'm so here for that collaborative work and you're right like it would be amazing equally the fact that you've stated it and said it clearly you've already got that picture and image in your mind so I know it's something that can be done (laughs) equally I know something that you will do because you stay busy you stay booked and busy girl you be out here featured (laughs) on bird (laughs) featured on BBC (laughs) channel 4 documentaries I can't even keep up get me I can't keep up um we've got to. i cannot keep up but um and i think for me even speaking about that idea and i hope it's an idea that comes to fruition um yeah you really wanted to speak on things that you are doing now um quickly speaking on unchained poetry um the fact that you you are you people's managers do you manage people correct me if i'm wrong yeah so i i yes. manage i've got my artists that i manage you've got artists, artists that i manage i actually you have four artists now who are sick um, and I saw them on Unchained Nights. And you did it. Oh my God. And I love them because it's just seeing them grow has been like such an inspiration for me. Like, you know, it's funny because when I met them, they were like, no, I'm not staying on stage to do a QA. What do you mean? Yeah. I just wrote it all in my bars, friend of mm-hmm. mine. No, I'm not doing it. Mm. Like, they're just a quick, like, just two minutes. No, I'm not doing it, man. They just did they list, just listen to the bars in it, Brenda. I'm like, mm. okay, cool. Because I didn't want to push them. But now, these boys are doing, they're sitting on panels, they're answering it questions. Is. I'll leave them in a room and they go and like speak. And like, every now and again, I'll walk past them. Mm. And the conversations they were having were so powerful. Like, mm. it was just like, I just felt like a proud mother. And mm. I, I even got kids, but these are my children, big old grown children. Like, mm. um, mm-hmm. So yeah, I've got my artists and they are doing amazing. Um, exactly. 
also I wanted to just quickly ask you um in terms of all the work you're doing is there one particular piece of work that you've done that you're like like has your heart yeah I I personally think the prison work like going and leading workshops especially when it came to doing a workshop in Downview which is a prison that I was in you know, I, I still remember the wing. I you know I was on the I was on the south. I remembered everything flushed back to me. And I was honest, I said to them, Look, guys, I'm not here to tell you off. I'm not here to write you up. I ain't got no red pen. Mm. Like literally, I'm not going to try and silence you. But mm. I lived here in mm. Downview. I said, The seas south, is that still the naughty side? Yeah. And everyone's like, Yeah. I was like, Yeah, that's where I was. And everyone's like, Oh. Mm. and it just went quiet Mm. do you understand and for me everyone says oh Brendan you're a poet I could go and perform I've yes I've done TED talk yes I've done hey wait wait wait, hold on hold on say that again you did what talk I've done a TED talk (laughs) mad 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 and that was probably the biggest crowd of people that I've ever performed for but when I performed for them women something was different like it was even there was just yes 40 people but really and truly each of the each each one of them women connected to my words in so many different ways you know when I performed ain't I a woman Mm. you know how like you know the response we got at the event at your book launch babes let me tell you the response that I got in that room I'm telling you women were stomping feet there was just all the way like they were like and then literally like when i asked the question like um what's it without the gal them can they be any man them mm. everyone was like no 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 like the women were going mad and i remember going oh my god <laughs> I, it was i was taken back road mm. to victory talking about my going into prison like awaiting sentencing being in jail like it was like for the first time I was performing for the people that needed to hear it. Hear it. And for me, that was when I was like, this has to continue. If I lead a workshop, it really hurts me to leave. And then it's like, I don't know, three, four months later, then I do another yeah. workshop. I need that work to continue. And when I went back the second time, now the women know me. Like before it was like, yeah, we know of her from National Prison Radio and whatever. Da, da, da. But now they know me. Oh, if the God. inmates are like, we want to work with her because they can see. And I guess there's probably something there with you, with women or people who have been to prison. Um, yep. And I guess what I wanted to ask you, if you had any advice, like explicit advice, what would that advice be to people who have been, who are currently in or who may end up in prison? So for people that are coming out of prison, I would say to remember the patience that you had to have in jail Mm. and times that by three Mm -hmm. when you get out Mm -hmm. because everyone kind of thinks you go to prison you do a sentence you're out you're free freedom is here no your sentence really begins when you come out of jail because Mm -hmm. that's when you're back into the real world with a conviction with maybe no house maybe no job maybe you know it's very hard for you to get back on your feet and in that time is when you have to have patience because mm. if you don't have patience so little things are going to call you you know quick money schemes are going to call you you know being out in a in an area that you shouldn't be in is going to call you because you mm. have nothing to do so yeah. you have to have patience so that's what i would say to people that's coming out of jail because there is life after prison but you have to search for it. you have to work very hard in order to to have a successful life after prison if you want to call it or basically just achieve life after prison um for people that are looking at a sentence or maybe are going to prison i would say try really really hard to connect your mind to something on the outside world and Mm -hmm. and when i say something i mean it could be a person it could be a place whether it's your flat whether it's your mum's garden, whether it's a jacket that you owned that you are so, you just want that jacket back, attach yourself to something. One thing that I realised in Joel, if you have nothing to think about when you're in there, like, for example, I always used to think, oh, my God, my little sisters, I'm not going to be there to take them to their first day of this school or their first yeah. day in this year, because that, that, that was my job. Like, when I was going yeah. to secondary school, I take them. So 
in my head, I kind of made sure that I had still had that connection with them. And I think the whole thought of being able to come home to back to my family, it kept, kept me strong, even though I was weak in the beginning, it kept me strong. So I think when you're in jail, you have to find something, even one thing that you don't want to lose, mm. that you love so much more than ever getting back in trouble mm-hmm. and focus on that because mm-hmm. you have to take your mind away. Like it's so, it's crazy, but you basically have to re- remove, your body's in prison, but your mind is not in prison. So basically yeah. keep your mind free and just don't, don't lock your mind up, yeah. if that makes sense. No, that that makes um, so much sense. That makes so much sense. And I feel like you are a prime example, like definitely life after prison. And not just like an enjoyable life, fulfillable life, a life where you're achieving your dreams, yeah. a life where you're networking, a life where you're just happy, you're at peace inside yeah. and out. And I guess speaking to you, being around you since we met, I can see that you are that through you are definitely a light. And I'm so excited for all the things you have done, but right. even the things you're going to do. I can't wait for us to collaborate, even though we've already collaborated, actually. Right. Too. But it's like, I'm super excited to do some more work with you and to see all the things that we're going to do. Equally, oh, I love it. Right. The fact that you're forever trying to bust me. You'll be like, I'm doing this because I told him about you still. So, no matter, and I love and respect that because not everybody's about that. Not everyone does. Um, yeah. And so I just want to thank you for your time and thank you for joining me today. Thank it's been a pleasure. Oh, one thing. One thing that I'd like to say ask for help okay that's one thing actually mm-hmm. because when you're at jail you don't want to ask for help because then again it's that weak part of you you're like oh, i'm weak i mean ask for help asking for help doesn't mean you're weak it mm-hmm. actually makes you a lot stronger in the long run because <laughs> that's how you connect so mm-hmm. ask for help guys because honestly once you ask for help people actually start like showing up for you and that's what yeah. you need after jail or even in jail so mm-hmm. yeah i had to yeah. drop that in there no, I'm, I'm, I'm here for all the gems, girl. I'm here for you sharing all the gems. But yeah, once again, thank you for your time. I appreciate you being here.